Okay. Well, hi everybody, and welcome to today's talk. Hi. I'm Chris, and I'm a member of the Guelph Skeptics, and we are co-hosting tonight's event with the University of Toronto Secular Alliance, and Kate here is the uh, president of this club. Uh, so, on behalf, on behalf of both clubs, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And before I uh, tell you a bit more, uh, I just wanted to point out we have there's um, books for sale at the back, and there's going to be a QA and a uh, after the talk, talk to me on around an hour, maybe less than more, there'll be time for some Q&A, and so you can uh, uh, have a look at the books, you can have some refreshments, we have sandwiches, and there'll be some more uh, later on. So, now, the, the World Skeptics was organized uh, at the University of Guelph as a venue for the discussion of various topics using science and critical thinking. And our goals are to help inform students and the public uh, about the importance of logic and critical thought, uh, to investigate paranormal and pseudo-scientific claims, and to be a secular voice on campus. Uh, and we're a campus group of the Toronto-based uh, Center for Inquiry in Ontario, uh, who from our very inaugural event have been happy to provide resources and support to uh, our initiatives and to our events that advance our shared cause for science, for reason, and free inquiry. And then in particular, we're grateful for this for CFI for helping in advertising for tonight's event. And our group is also an affiliate of the Secular Student Alliance. And the SSA was instrumental in making tonight's event possible, uh, mainly in providing a speaker and in bringing him to Toronto. And we're incredibly pleased to be working together with the Secular Student Alliance, and we've been very forthcoming with their support of our club. Now, uh, it's a real privilege for me to be introducing tonight's speaker. Uh, Henry Meta attended the University of Illinois in Chicago, where uh, graduated with honors in both math mathematics and in biology. Uh, and while there, he helped establish their first secular student group, uh, the Students Without Religious Dogma. And he's now earning his master's in math education at DePaul University and works as a high school math teacher in Chicago. And Kevin is the chair of the Secular Student Alliance Board of Directors. And he has worked in the past with the Center for Inquiry and he is also an SSA representative to the Secular Coalition for America. Uh, he's probably most famously known as the eBay atheist uh, and as the author of the book I Sold My Soul on eBay. Uh, and Hemet is the self proclaimed friendly atheist, and he, his attempts to open up conversations between atheists and those of religious faiths can be found on his blog, uh, which is friendlyatheist.com. And tonight, Hemet will be sharing his experiences with us uh, um, viewing faith through an atheist eyes. So please join me in welcoming Hemet. Thank you guys. Uh, thanks to the University of Guelph and the University of Toronto for bringing me here. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Uh, so basically what I want to talk to you about is what that book is all about. Um, what does it mean? Can you even sell your soul on eBay? Um, explain that story to you and kind of explain why that project, this whole thing, got attention. Got, it actually worked in establishing some dialogue when a lot of things that a lot of other atheists and secular humanists have done have just failed miserably. Um, and hopefully we can learn something from that. So what I want to do is give you a little bit of background uh, on me personally. Um, my faith growing up was a religion called Jainism. Has anyone here actually heard of Jainism? See, that's shocking to me because growing up, no one I knew had ever heard of Jainism. <laughs> um, and one of the first times I actually heard about it in the past few years was if you read The End of Faith by Sam Harris or you read The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, both of them mention Jainism in their books. And Sam Harris, for example, gives it some context. You know, his argument in the end of faith is that fundamentalist religions of all kinds are bad for us, and we need to stop that. And then he goes on to say, but I'm, you know what? If everyone was fundamentalist Jain, maybe we wouldn't be so bad off. <laughs> so even Sam Harris doesn't have that big of a problem with it. Um, what does Jainism actually believe? What do Jains believe? Uh, Jains aren't so much of a religion as they are a philosophy. They believe mostly in nonviolence. So if you meet a Jain, they're usually vegetarian. If you think of a very stereotypical Jain, you're thinking of someone like a monk who might cover their mouth with a cloth, might sweep up the floor in front of them when they walk so they don't kill any bugs on their, when they're walking. We're talking fundamental, that's a fundamentalist Jain to me. 
Um, but besides that, they also believe in uh, telling the truth, non-possessiveness, uh, non-materialism, things like that. A lot of philosophical ideas that I think a lot of people in this room would agree with. Um, now, there is a flip side to that. They do believe in heaven and hell. They do believe uh, that you, they believe in reincarnation. And how this works, uh, the way I always thought of it, is that in your life, you if you do bad deeds, you accumulate karma. It's kind of like dust particles. If you do bad things, you get all these <laughs> karma particles on you. And if you do good things, you shed those particles of karma. And your goal in life is to shed, like get a net loss of karma particles. So that way when you die, if you have less bad karma particles on you, in your next life, you're in a better position in life. And being a human is pretty good, but if I'm a human now and I did good deeds in my life, in my next life, I'll be a really rich human or something. Um, but if I do a lot of bad deeds, maybe I turn into an ant or something. This is, this is the belief that I was uh, brought up believing. So it's those beliefs that, you know, when I was like 14 years old, uh, my family moved around a couple times when I was a kid, but the most devastating one was the week before high school started, and everyone's very excited about starting high school, you have your friends, you have your place. We moved a week before high school started to Chicago. Uh, we moved from Tennessee. We moved to Chicago, and that was devastating to me. And the thought that was going through my head, and I understand how uh, selfish this sounds, was this move is bad. This must be the worst thing to happen to anyone ever. <laughs> Therefore, God must not exist. <laughs> That's the thought that was going through my head. Now, if that doesn't make a lot of sense, then the truth is, I, I, I don't have any. I didn't have any connection to atheism or anything. But I thought, you know, why would God do this to me? And wait a minute. Now that I think about it. I don't think heaven or hell makes any sense, or the reincarnation thing. And I would start going online late at night, trying to figure out, like, what does it mean if I don't believe in this stuff? And the word that I kept coming to was atheist. And after a couple months of this, it kind of dwelled on me that, huh, I think I am an atheist. And that's when I kind of shed those religious beliefs, even though I still kept up with the philosophy. I'm still a vegetarian, I'm still pretty, I think, non-materialistic. Um, but anyway, that's where I'm coming from, that's Jainism. Um, it's big in India, obviously, or relatively big in India. Outside of India, Chicago, where I'm from, is probably the biggest hub of Jainism. And outside of Chicago, there's also hubs of Jainism in New Jersey, which makes no sense to me, but it's there. Um, but that's Jainism. Uh, Sina, a quick question. Uh, is Jainism before or after Buddhism? Because you have the same belief on reincarnation. That's and the nature. It's a good mm -hmm. question. I don't know enough about the history to answer that. I think it's after Buddhism. I think Buddhism is older, but don't quote me. Chinese could be an offshoot somehow. It could be. It could be. Yeah, and I think it, there's some uh, parts of Jainism that stem from Hinduism, too. There are some connections. Um, so I think it takes a little bit from other religions, too. But I don't know enough about the history. All I knew is kind of what I was taught, and I was never taught. You suppose that had a single founder? Last question. Um, well, James, I don't think there is a single founder. The, the, I, I mean, there's a lot of details with the, the history of it, but one of the things they believe is if you reincarnate yourself enough times and you shed all of that bad karma, you will break through that cycle of reincarnation and you'll attain your body. And 24 people, 24 Thirthunkers, they're called, have achieved nirvana. And each of them is kind of the teacher or the Jesus type of figure. Um, that's pretty much the history extent that I know of Jainism. But uh, what happened is, you know, in high school, then I was an atheist for four years, and I didn't really tell a lot of people. Maybe close friends knew, but not a lot of, I didn't tell my family. I didn't really tell a lot of friends or anything like that. Um, and it was pretty much that way throughout high school. Then I went to college, and I think I was ready in college to meet other atheists, because at the time I really didn't know anyone. I didn't really know any internet, like people online to talk to. So it turned out I met a girl in college who was also an atheist, she was in my English class, and we ended up saying, you know what, there's not a single atheist group at our campus. Let's start one. So we started a group, it was called Students Without Religious Dogma, SWORD. We like that. <laughs> kind of violent, but whatever. We, thought it was um, we started this group, and it was really great, because anyone like the Toronto or Guelph people can tell you it's exciting to know 